Um, hello everyone, thank you so much for joining us this evening for the second conversation in the Relationship is the Project series. Hi Henning. Um, I'm Jade and uh, hosting this panel conversation this evening with these fantastic people who I'll introduce in a moment. Um, before I start, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the lands upon which we're gathering today and pay my respects to the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation um, and to remind us all that art, uh, First Nations people are the first artists, the first storytellers, the first creators of culture, the first people who turned country and song lines into stories that we could read and listen to and just that we're all operating from that base and um, sovereignty has never been ceded. I'd also like to pay my respects to any First Nations people in the room today and of course to all of the contributors in the relationship is the project who also are First Nations practitioners who shared their wisdom with you through this book, through these stories and continue to do so. I'd also like to thank Olivia Allen over there for inviting us to have this conversation in the first place, which started, I suppose, a couple of years ago now, but a um, pandemic got in the way, but here we are. So thank you so much for having us, Olivia. We're very grateful. Thank you to Colette Brennan for hosting us at the Abbotsford Convent, to all of the Abbotsford Convent gang up the back there, and Tech, thanks for making it possible for us to be here with you today. For those of you who um, don't know, The Relationship is the Project is a book. Um, there already has been one edition and we're lucky tonight, you're sort of getting a very special preview because I'm joined by the wonderful Simona Castricum, Tristan Meacham, Timiki O'Connor and Jen Ray who are contributors for the second edition that's yet to be released. So firstly, I want to say thank you to all of you because I know like we're on deadline for the manuscript at the moment. So <laughs> we're, in a, we're in contact all the, every day um, trying to wrangle all of these chapters into what will be um, a brand new edition, um, 32 chapters, 12 new commissions. Um, so all of the chapters in the first edition have been revised and um, every contributor has had an opportunity to redesign or reshape their chapter in some way, and then we have all of these brilliant new commissions, um, which you'll hear a little bit about tonight, but not too much because, well, they're still being finalised, and um, you'll get to read them in the new year, come around the 1st of March. So, um, what I was hoping, because, you know, reading bios is always a little bit weird and awkward, so what I was hoping is that each of these fantastic speakers would in fact introduce themselves by sharing a little bit about their chapter, why this particular piece of work is important to them and what it's about so that you know um, what's coming in the context of the book early next year. And we might kick off with Jen Ray, if you don't mind. <laughs> She's just in the middle. <laughs> Um, Tanchi. Um, my name is Jen Ray. Um, I am Métis Scottish from Treaty 6 territory on Turtle Island. Um, the Northwest is our mother, which is um, Alberta and Saskatchewan in the northern parts. Um, thank you, Jade. Um, thanks for inviting um, Claire. I wrote this um, paper with Claire G. Coleman, so thank you for the invitation for that. Um, the piece that Claire and I worked on um, is about relational accountability and reworlding. Um, what sort of prompt, we were asked to write something in relation to climate resilience, that's a lot of the work that we do. And um, what we felt was that um, our work is a lot about intergenerational justice and sort of really think prioritizing that as our starting point when we think about um, how do we adapt to the climate emergency. And we've been working for quite some time in this space and we recognize that um, Often what happens when we have sort of community-related activities, um, there are extractive practices that happen. Um, we've had instances where, you know, we put our protocols up and people take photos of it or they email me and they'll say, can we have your protocols? And, I'm, and we're going, well, you haven't quite earned it. 
right? And so, but, but I understand the importance of having protocols and you want, you know, the, the intention is there. So what we thought we'd do is we'd write this piece about relational accountability because from a First Nations perspective, everything is relational. Um, and what we, want, what we want to sort of put forth is that when you, when you come together as community, you form relations, it's best to bring your community with you rather than to, to pinch little things and take it because you, it loses its meaning, it loses its relationality. So that's what our chapter is about. Thank you, Jade. Um, um, Kamlebene Nimori and Bula Vanaka. My name is um, Tim O'Connor. I am from Kiribati, a small little Pacific, South Pacific island in the uh, find the, the International Dateline and the equator where they intersect and you'll find them there. Um, that's where my mom's from. I'm, my dad's Fijian. I'm a little bit, I've, I grew up in different parts of the world, I think, just because my mom um, was fungied. So my auntie brought me up and my extended family brought me up. So I got the, the opportunity to be exposed to different, um, yeah, different experiences, which has been great. Um, Jay, thank you for um, inviting me. I, I was quite honored when she approached me and she asked, to, yeah, to write something about what I've been doing in the, uh, I guess, for about 17 years, and that's um, evaluation. My background was in public health. I, did, I was a public health practitioner in New Zealand, and so I, so I spent um, years just de designing, developing interventions, programs, community-based programs, because that's what my heart is, and um, I sort of fell in sideways to this world of evaluation, and so, I got really interested in culturally safe evaluation practices because a lot of the uh, evaluation methodologies and, and theories were quite Western and weren't appropriate and were never um, taken in or um, owned by, um, yeah, well, where I'm from anyway, a lot of the evaluators, what they do is they fly in and they fly out. They take our, our wisdom and they don't sh ever share it back. So that was where that's what I came from. And so I wrote my, I was thinking about how to frame the, the 1500 word and uh, words uh, chapter and I thought about my first journey of, um, into the world of evaluation and I thought, okay, what would I tell myself if I was starting again and what are the key things? Because I, I found that I just sort of went, and I think a lot of evaluators though attest to this, the fact that they, when they get into evaluation, they don't go directly, they go, you know, they do some sort of discipline, whether it's science, math, or engineering, or I don't know. I, I did health science and public health, and then I went to evaluation, and so it was such a long route, and it, would, it, it was quite confusing, to be honest. <laughs> um, and so I thought, I, what can I write about? And I thought about evaluation um, the last, I guess, 17 years was, it was sort of, like the culmination of learning was, it, I, I saw it sort of was these three things. I called them the ensemble, uh, the evaluation ensemble, and that's the evaluation, um, the value, the value end, which is the project, the arts project, the um, the evaluation, which is the evaluation of the um, that project, and the evaluator. So those three things is, was my focus of that chapter. Really um, unpacking what those three. Um, ensemble sort of look like in a culturally safe space. Um, I sort of argue that it is, I guess, if you have them in harmony, um, you, one of the outcomes is a culturally safe evaluation practice, I guess, and uh, amongst other things. Um, yeah, and other practical things, um, but I thought that's a really good framing if you're new, particularly an art practitioner, thinking about evaluation and trying to assess your impact. Um, it's, it, you can get, lost in the amount of <laughs> literature that's out there, and you don't know which one is the sort. But yeah, thinking about those three things is really important, and that's what I unpack. But I won't go into any more detail. Yeah, your turn. Hi, everyone. My name is Tristan Meacham, and I would also like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we gather here today paying my respects to First Nation elders uh, and all First Nation people that are here with us in the room today. Um, I would also like to extend um, my gratitude to Jade, along with everyone uh, here on the panel for inviting me and my art wife uh, over there, Beck Reed. Yep, 
Um, many of you will know her, the queen to my man, um, sorry, the man to my queen, um, uh, together to participate in um, this exciting collaboration with so many great thinkers working in community space. Um, the chapter that we co-wrote um, in the relationship is the project really prioritises um, the cultural rights of older people. Um, Western culture isn't really great at celebrating and holding the wisdom of older people at the core. Um, but uh, we have a great privilege of being on these lands um, uh, with the opportunity to learn from First Nation people and acknowledge their relationships to land, culture, community and their elders. First Nation elders participating in an ongoing and timeless intergenerational solidarity, um, sharing knowledge, values and culture. And it's something that is honoured and articulated in a daily practice. This acknowledgement of elders as oracles within First Nation cultures is something of an inspiration uh, and also great learning. Western culture is uh, not all, un the only culture to learn from this, but my own uh, uh, identification within the LGBTIQ culture has a lot to learn. Um, the lack of intergenerational connection, the disjunct between young and old, uh, about not necessarily honouring those that have come before, about ensuring that we allow anyone to transform into their authentic self, no matter their age. Uh, LGBTIQ plus inclusivity needs to think around uh, all elements, including the ageism, which is inherent in some sections of the community. Um, ageism is universal, um, uh, but ageism is rife. And so with uh, us all knowing that in about 2023, the world's population will double, people over 60 will double to about 20%, we're at a real interesting and fantastic opportunity to prioritise the rights, uh, celebrate um, older people within our community. And hopefully um, our chapter provides some cheeky little tips um, and some cultural practices and processes that we've learnt from dancing around uh, for a decade or two. I'm only 20. Um, <laughs> So if, I would also like to thank Beck Reed, of course, uh, my constant companion and art husband and collaborator, um, uh, who has completely been an amazing ally in our recent body of work celebrating LGBTIQ plus elders. Thanks. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Simona Castricum, and um, it's always a real privilege to, to speak on, um, on Wurundjeri land, Kulin Nation. I, I grew up on, on Boonwurrung land, um, one of the few trans queers in there, in this sort of music scene that I hang out in that are actually from Nam, and everyone sort of comes from Brisbane or Adelaide or wherever, you know, so I'm just kind of like, I've been here all my life, haven't escaped. Um, uh, but I, I think what so wonderful about that is that I've 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 seen um, I think a, a trans and gender diverse um, uh, seen kind of yeah you know, really kind of blossom in in Nam over the years um, and so my background is in architecture and in music as well and I've seen, I guess, that world through those two lenses, but also in my lens as, as being a transgender woman, and I sort of sit in this interesting um, sort of Venn diagram of um, where to kind of put those things together. So um, I, I just did my PhD at the University of Melbourne, the Melbourne School of Design, and um, finished that off, and, and I met um, CQ Kunan, who um, invited me to write a chapter for The Relationship is the Project. And um, I was like, oh, great. I gave that uh, as a present to an ex-girlfriend of mine about you know two years ago. And uh, I was like, great. So um, to be part of it's really good. Thanks, Jade. <laughs> Yeah, now I, well, no, I, I was going to say I could gift it 
to her with me in it, but we're not <laughs> dating, so that wouldn't be a vibe, eh? But anyway, so I, I usually tell jokes at the start of things just to test out my audience, and I write my own shit, and um, yeah, anyway, how am I going? But anyway, um, yeah, no, okay, yeah, cool. Okay, so where was I? Ah, so I'm writing this chapter, and um, so, and it's, well, lo and behold, it's about gender and public space. You know, that's sort of the working title, which we've got to sort of fix, you know, within the next 24 hours or something like that. But, you know, we'll, you know, I, I, we're all pulling it out of our ass, you know. Oh, we're being filmed. Um, okay. <laughs> but essentially, I guess, like, I've been unpacking, just to for the, let's put on a serious note, um, how architecture, urban planning, um, codes gendered space, how it produces gendered space, and how it imposes cis-normativity, um, heteronormativity upon um, those gendered spaces and how that affects trans and gender diverse people, how it affects our um, life chances, how it affects our capacity to engage uh, fully in civic life and to what extent it disproportionately affects the, 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 the lives and but also the spaces that are produced by trans and gender diverse people. You know, what are those atmospheres of violence or those contested spaces um, that, that, are, that, that we must navigate and have navigated historically, but also like what futures exist and how have we survived? Um, what sort of, uh, I guess, relationships have we built together and, and what are the relationships that we need to build in order to realise the radical worlds? Uh, you know, we need to, 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 to continue. So CQ and I are really interested, I think, in, I guess, like how reframing architecture, design, spatial design, urban planning, landscape architecture, how we can reframe this practice from something which has really been in service perhaps to neoliberal needs and how it might be in, it, how it's actually in service to community. Uh, and so, because in, in order to understand community, we need to understand the com who we're in community with. And, you know, this is what healthy communities are all about. This is what the built environment's all about. Uh, so we're really just unpacking those things as we go through. Thank you. Please put your hands together for this fantastic group of people. So in the curation and thinking of the second edition, who I might say also I'd like to shout out to Kate Larson, who is my collaborator, a co-editor, and also to Jax Brown and Cara Kirkwood, who are both um, editors on the book and sensitivity readers as well. Um, but while thinking about this edition and certainly about the chapters that have been commissioned through this particular time, in a post-pandemic, if we can call it that. I'm not sure what we're calling it right now. Please feel free to let me know. Um, but <laughs> what does it mean to think about building new worlds? Whether they're digital worlds, physical worlds, cultural worlds, psychological worlds, spiritual worlds. Um, what, what does it mean for us to actually think about um, actively, proactively thinking and doing that work together in the world that we want to create? So... When we came together to have a bit of a pre-chat, um, that was really where we kicked off our conversation. Um, it went in all sorts of directions from kind of what is design justice to critiquing co-design to really critiquing this idea of impact measurement and understanding what that means. It was about kind of the role of welcoming. We talked about joy. We talked about all sorts of um, people and inspirations that we had. So we're going to attempt to reframe a little bit of that conversation and bring it back to you tonight um, and then hopefully we'll have a little bit of time at the end possibly only around 10 minutes but we'd love to open it up to you to invite any questions so I guess where I, I'm wondering if we could kick off given that we all work in spaces where safety is paramount um, what does it mean to think about cultural safety psychological safety and safety generally um, when we're engaging with communities. Um, Jen, I know you're sitting up going <laughs> by me again, <laughs> but I, I do wonder if you want to kick us off there, particularly um, 
talking also about extractive participation and the ways that we're forced to do that, which also create unsafe situations and circumstances to work in. Okay, thanks, Jade. Um, because um, the work that we do with, so um, Claire Coleman and I, just to sort of back up a little bit, Claire Coleman and I um, wrote a film um, during the pandemic called Refugium. And Refugium, the word refugia is about basically the profound reorganizing of things when it comes to like um, an environment that is volatile and an organism can't survive in that environment. So they go into refugia and they reorganize their biological systems in order to come back out again. And Claire and I really were thinking a lot about this in terms of the pandemic, and we were thinking about the conversations that weren't being had in the climate context. And the main one being, we're not actually thinking about future generations. And I'd like to come back to the fact about 65, you know, that um, the baby boom result going to be over 65. You know, what does that mean for intergenerational justice and so forth? Um, or maybe that's a coffee chat later, I don't know. Um, but in, in doing this work, you know, we, we went to our elders, we started talking to them, you know, and that was the point where they said, yep, yeah, we can come into this space and we can start working. And we were working in a way where we didn't have a plan. Um, we went in with good faith, you know, that we're bringing people together. Oftentimes when you do projects, you jump in and you've got a plan and you, you do a production. We're working in a way where we don't have a plan because we don't have the luxury of time in this space. We actually need to um, engage in experimental processes. And we went forth doing this work and we encountered basically different situations where we had people showing up and extracting things from the elders and it wasn't a culturally safe space for them. And so we convened a protocols workshop at Arts House. We spent quite a bit of time really talking about what does it mean to create safe spaces for um, our elders, our collaborators, the people who work with us, our audiences, our participants, and so forth. And with um, aunties Bronwyn Rezaim, Auntie Vicky Cousins, Mahuba Suleiman, and Vicky Kanai, as well as some others, Claire and myself, um, we developed protocols. And we and there are Center for Reworlding protocols. And so whenever we do any activity. We have, um, we have something called a registry, and we have everybody sign the registry, the Reworlders registry. And then we go through the protocols, and we talk about um, what a knowledge circle is, or a yearning circle, or um, there's other names for them. But basically, it's, it's about a place, it's a holding of space, not holding space, it's a holding of space for knowledge to happen. Because from an indigenous point of view, it's not about the knowledge itself, it's about the space in between the, know the knowledge giver and the knowledge receiver. And so we use those protocols um, to hold that space so that we can engage in that experimental process that we have sort of um, working with good faith, that we have good intentions, and that um, if you are, if you have been inspired, you know, genera where it's a space of generosity, if you have been inspired in that space, keep us together, bring the circle with you. And whenever we talk with, Cl what Claire always talks about bringing the circle with you, bringing the circle with you, because that's when we can really amplify each other's work, that's when we start to deepen our relationships. This is how we can disrupt um, capitalist and Western ways of extraction and um, cutting storylines and the individual. So that's what we do um, in terms of creating spaces. Um, I just grabbed the microphone only, wish, only because I wished I had your cultural protocols at the beginning of the Coming Back Out Ball project, which was established in 2016, but developed significant um, uh, attention during the same-sex marriage debacle. Um, only a couple of years ago. We're really great here in Australia about, about placing uh, marginalised communities under the scrutiny of the majority so that they can judge us from afar without any lived experience. Um, but this um, dance club uh, was set up as well um, in the city of Yarra. See what I did there, Olivia? Um, uh, and it's been running since 2017, monthly, every month. Um, we, as you said, hadn't planned anything and just arrived, um, Beck and I, and we had, I think, around six elders uh, 
uh, and one really enthusiastic um, dancer and one curmudgeon that liked champagne. Um, but during that time, uh, while we were trying to establish a safe space, a cultural space, we also realised that we were, became very, very quickly the spokesperson for um, uh, sh showcasing stories of euphoria, of queer euphoria, during a time when actually the pressure of the community was at significant risk. Media was only reporting significant issues of LGBTIQ plus no, no, no. Um, and so the complexity that we had to deal with in terms of that space, which developed quite a lot of traction within the community, but also uh, interest from media, print, radio, television, oh, and a feature documentary that wanted to follow us at that time. So the complexity of actually being in that space, both as spokespeople, but also of um, wanting to care and build the safe space that we were in so that people who were arriving for the very first time to be out and who they were, to have a dance, to actually just be in space, culturally safe space. The complexity of that for us, Beck and I, we learned a lot. We made mistakes. Uh, we negotiated space in a very, very detailed way, but um, uh, the multiplicity of what we had to hold at the beginning because that project was still taking time to establish itself around what the protocols were was a really interesting and complex and quite tiring journey. Uh, so the moral of that is, that's only 10 years ago, we felt exhausted by that decade. So I can only imagine what communities who have to deal with that day in, day in, decade in, decade in have to feel. Tim, I wonder if you'd like to add to that in terms of, you know, what it means to create Obviously. cultural safety in the context of, you know, methodologies and systems that can often be considered mm. quite colonial or, you know, mm -hmm. top down. Yeah. Um, gosh, I feel like um, whenever I come into, um, as an evaluator coming into the, particularly the arts and creative space was, uh, gosh, it was before pre-COVID um, and I was still doing my PhD then and I, uh, when I first started, I wanted to, I was, it was, it's an evaluation, how boring <laughs> can it be? I was doing my PhD in evaluation as well, um, just because I loved it a lot. And it was just an, an area that I thought I could make a lot of impact in, um, especially around you know, having control over the measures, over control over designing of um, the outcomes that we wanted, or what, at least the communities, what communities wanted, and me being part of that community, um, that was important. And so. Going into the art space, I think it was very, it's a whole different sort of kettle of fish. Evaluations is quite a standard. Those practices are quite standard and you can almost apply it in different sectors. And, um, but I remember my first time going into Footscray Community Arts Center, my challenge was going in and um, Jay, um, my first task as a volunteer was to go and talk to every creative producer and artist and performer and in Footscray Community Arts Center. and. Um, and just get to know them and figure out how we can um, how we can assess impact their impact, and um, I just remember back then I was like, how am I going to convince um, these creative producers, these artists, these creatives, to think about evaluation and even engage in something like this? Of course, you, get, you know, you being engaging, your personality can only go so so much so far. Um, but I remember thinking I had to really think hard about. Um, separating the evaluation process from the creative process and, and, and making sure that it wasn't um, in, uh, imposing on that because that was important to them. Um, but yeah, so that was one thing. Uh, but in terms of the culturally safe space that I was thinking about um, with them and talking about it, it was all about relationships, I think. I think one of the things that, particularly in evaluation, because we don't, as an evaluator, and I, I'm, I'm sort of guessing, I'm not sure if there's, are there any evaluators here tonight, or are there more, more art practitioners, I'd imagine, cultural community um, practitioners? Yeah? Or, yeah? I'm sort of, that's where I'm, I'm thinking about th that, them, the creative producers that I'm working with, and I'm, and if you are indeed about to, to embark on a, uh, an impact measurement journey, um, and how do you create um, a culturally safe space? It's, um, I will, I want to say something different, slightly different, um, so to add on to what you've said before, but I think it's all about looking inward a little bit and looking inward. Um, evaluation's got that term values and um, introspection is really important to know what your values are 
your culture values. I know um, everyone, every, every ethnicity in this world has a culture um, um, because in evaluation, what you, the, the, the practice is all about going out there and making judgments on other people's work. And if you are going to be wearing that hat on, understanding your values is actually really important because it's gonna come out and it's gonna cause, you know, it's gonna be by some of your conclusions. But knowing, being aware of what those things are right from the, the, the get-go is actually really important. Um, it's also, I, I've started, when I was working at VACA, Victorian Aboriginal Child Care a Agency, this is, last three years, it was, it was the most amazing learning journey I had. And I, I tried to do this um, uh, values identification sort of thing right at the beginning with my team and really just talking about what a success looks like with, you, with everyone and just sort of couching it in that way. What does success look like? So it was sort of a meeting before we had done, we were gonna implement the project and everyone went around and they spoke about what success was. My manager, of course, she, her success was uh, things like um, timelines and making sure we delivered, whereas my cultural mentor, Uncle Donald, was all about relationships and connections. And, and so it was quite interesting just to, if you, if you use that and thinking about where people, you can almost sort of work your way back and see where people's values are and in your work almost use that to leverage that into making, sort of meeting everyone's needs and sort of aligning to people's values. And I think through that, you can sort of, um, I found that the cult cultural safe space was a lot easier to go through and everyone's sort of, okay, I, I, we're all very different. Let's just acknowledge that from the get-go. We're all, but we're all sort of trying to get to, to measure some impact. Um, and the way to do that is by just working collaboratively together in a culturally safe space. Um, by foremost looking inward and figuring out what your values are and, and you know, where are you? Are you a community person? Do you care about outcomes? Do you care about the future, the youth? Whatever it is, it's just identifying those things is really important. Design justice. Well, I guess design justice, I mean, it was a, a, there's this great book by Sasha costanza Chok called Design Justice, and it's really about, I guess, um, looking at the way that, um, uh, I guess, you know, different parts of community have, there's like a distribution, I guess, of, it's like similarly, I guess, of, of life chances and of, and of privilege and all this sort of thing, and trying to find, I guess, more equitable ways than we can... Um, design our worlds, and that's not only, I guess, in a spatial context, but also um, in you know designing systems that you know uh, you know that that determine things like the healthcare system or the justice system or you know any of these things. Uh, and what I love about the book is that it um, it, it it looks at design justice from a cross disciplinary capacity. So you know I can automatically look at it and see how. You know, um, there's opportunities for, for architecture um, and design to work with the healthcare system, to work with the, the, the criminal law, to work with the justice system, to work with government, public sector, all of these things. Um, and, and I think that that's something that, that architecture has always tried to, to do. It has, architecture occupies a very, I guess, um, unique seat at the table in that it's a sector-based industry, you know, and it's got to work on all of these certain building typologies and urban typologies that, you know, producing everything from stadiums to prisons to, um, you know, schools, you know, all of these different sectors. But I, I was interested in how design justice served as a methodology where I could read into things like queering or transing or, you know, abolition you know, a whole lot of different kind of, um, you know, or, you know, feminist methodologies as well, and looking into that and, and how that, yeah, reframes design as a, as a social justice practice. You know, and one of the things in, in architecture is the thing like participatory design, which I've s sort of been involved in as a, you know, within the architecture studio and, and to an extent it's sort of quite limited because the knowledge is quite extractive mm -hmm. and it ends up with the architect or sometimes it gets value managed out of the project, you know, there's like all of these, 
you know, all of these things that we're like, oh, well, the client wants this and the client wants that. And then all of a sudden it gets to, you know, before we do a set of tender drawings and it's over budget and a whole lot of things get, get cancelled out because they're not considered, they're, they're over and above what the original brief was or the client's gone, oh, we don't need them. And it's just kind of like, hey, like you've actually gone on a, a journey with all of these you know, actors as as they're called in the in the speak, and it's and then you've sort of cut out like their needs, and and here they are thinking that you've met you've met their needs, and now all of a sudden like you're 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 value managing that out, and that's what breaks trust over time. And and I think that making like successful projects is about creating those relationships of trust. And again, it's like we're constantly having to you know make sure that we're meeting targets on the Gantt chart and targets on, you know, with the quantity surveyor and it's just kind of like, no, forget, like, forget about the Gantt, tar Gantt chart, forget about all that stuff. Like, we need to maintain trust with those on the margins. But also, like, we need to bring in people who actually have the most challenging um, criticisms of the project because they're usually the ones that get value managed. It's like, oh, that person's too difficult, we're not going to speak to them, we're just going to show them complete drawings and um, they're going to think that they're being included but we're just not going to tell them that it's already gone to tender or something like that and, and it's just like a really, really shitty feeling and I know a few projects in my time that have gone ahead like that. Um, so yeah, Costanza Chalk and, and also myself, like we really see you know, this, this process of harvesting where, um, you know, these people are, you know, like people from on the margins of power um, and agency are bought in, you know, they're not very well remunerated, um, you know, and they're sort of like, you know, given a whole bunch of sticky, like, you know, post-it notes to stick on a board or something like that and it looks really pretty and they take a photo and they put it up on their social media and, and they use all of that. Um, knowledge and, and all that lived experience and it stays with that organisation or it stays with that studio or it stays with that, that research lab or whatever. Um, but that knowledge is really important and it doesn't always go into the project and it needs to stay in the project so that's why the relationship is the project, you know, like speaking to the thing of the... But it is, you know, like it's totally there and if it doesn't follow through into when you're actually you know, creating space, it's, it's not going to be there. Yeah. Absolutely, and I think knowledge sharing is really part of that process, isn't it? Um, there's one thing to consult, there's another thing to engage, there's another thing to design, but actually how often do we go back to communities and to people and practitioners and even, you know, if you're in a team of people in an organisation, how often do you go through a planning process and actually get the the download of that in a way that's useful and usable and practical. Um, yes, I do a lot of work working with people to bring structure out of ambiguity in some ways. And, um, and, and usually I'm not a finisher, which is why at the end of a book's a bit of a problem. <laughs> I'm like, oh, deadline, oh yeah, yeah. Um, and so I've always shied away from the reporting phase of stuff. <laughs> not helpful, um, particularly when actually those are the things that live on. And that's what I've come to really learn in consulting is that I can have the best possible process, I can have the most beautiful, powerful, extraordinary conversations, but if I don't document those properly, give them back to the people that had them with to kind of check and balance that and then actually have that in a way that it lives on, well, what happens to that information and how can it be kind of um, remembered and respected in the future. So yeah, finish, it's, it's important. Reporting, finishing deadlines, things like that. Um, <laughs> we talked a lot about critiquing co-design in our pre-chat, which sort of leads on from what you were just saying and who gets to decide it's a co-design process. Um, I wonder if you want to sort of speak to that and then we might jump to Tim just to, from an impact perspective, how we kind of critique that in the same way and then Jen and Tristan hear from you too. Yeah, well, um, like for instance in, you know, in, in, in design, um, in spatial design, 
you know, there are very few trans and gender diverse people who are at the design table. So we don't have much of a say in the worlds that we inhabit, yet, you know, we design our own worlds and we've been designing our own worlds, just, you know, forging our way through, like we've been around forever. And despite the invisibility that like this, this normative world wants to impose upon us, like we've still been designing our spaces, we've been finding community, um, you know, acting in resistance, you know, all of these great things, um, you know, like we have, you know, spaces of care, spaces of, um, you know, of political organising, of entertainment. So, so much of that knowledge is what we can actually bring to the design of our worlds. There was one thing I did at Melbourne Design Week about five years ago, which was where I um, just put um, on the panel, it was just a panel of, I guess, non-designers, um, people who were abs absolutely people who were capable of designing their own worlds and but didn't didn't know that they knew something about architecture but I guess I was the facilitator to be able to bring some of that out and I you know wanted the architects to sit in the audience which is a really cheeky thing to do for a design week thing but um because you know architects want to be you know, the superstars on the thing. So, um, and, you know, th but that spoke to, I guess, what's in Costanda Chalk's book, which is that, you know, you know, that, that non-designers are, are, we actually know like the spaces that we need. And, you know, but we're often left because cisgender people, you know, often make all of those design decisions for us, we're left you know, having to deal with those decisions on a daily basis. Now that needs to change. And in order for that to change, that there just needs to be, I guess that agency needs to be seeded. And, and there are ways to do it with, you know, changing the way that we think about participatory design or co-design so that those voices can actually, you know, have an influence on the spaces that we're, that we're putting together. Sorry. Um, so I guess impact, impact evaluation, uh, impact measurement. Um, the critiques around that at the moment I, are sort of in the arts. I, what's it? It's, a, it's, a, it's a, in the evaluation sector. One of the let me talk about it this way: framing it around the book, right? So there's a, in terms of the evaluation tri, trio or the art ensemble, the evaluate, the evaluate when the project. If you think, if you are the project person, if you think about just the project. So just to remind you again, the evaluation, the evaluation, the evaluator. Um, in terms of the, the, the project, the evaluant, one of the things to think about the project when they're working, if you are the person that's curating that project or you're the one coordinating, managing, one of the things that's really challenging for in that space is um, identifying what the impact is. I think a lot of the times that my experience in you know, working with artists and creative, creatives is that they think about, they don't really think about the impact further than what they're doing in terms of their art project, their artwork, their performance, their, um, and they um, sort of, yeah, one of the, particularly when you're creating that artwork, thinking about um, the broader things, um, the challenges with impact measurement is that in that space, that, spa that impact space is overlapping with other sectors as well. Um, so you are, your impact is actually not your true impact, it's contributing to this collective impact that's, you know, with other sectors. And so that's a huge thing that um, I think it's hard to, for projects to sort of articulate in their project plan to sort of say, here's what we're gonna deliver and here's how we're gonna contribute to this broader um, sector, uh, sector collaboration. Um, even identifying what's happening in the sector might be really difficult to figure out. But I think that's, that's a space that it might be um, really important. Um, so that's an example of the uh, evaluation. In terms of the evaluation, um, the metrics is probably the biggest thing that's hard because it's a collective impact. It's really hard to, to figure out what's going on. What is the direct um, pathway to that impact? Is this project actually connect, contributing to that impact further down the line, which is quite indirect? Uh, one of the things that I think the most useful thing to think about in that for evaluators is to um, if you are, if I, if you are the project, the so if you are wearing the, um, if you are the artist or the community um, 
cultural leader and you're doing the evaluation yourself and you have the evaluator hat on, think about um, just ma um, focusing on the activities you're delivering and focusing on um, the output. So yeah, knowing the difference between activity inputs, activities, outputs, so important. Because um, it makes a difference to figure out um, if that's what you have control over. Your inputs are your resources, the activities are the things that you do in the project. It could be the key activities, the key themes around the activities that you're doing. It could be, um, for, for example, a festival. You might have um, activities like a, um, some food stalls, some music events, and they don't have to be every single activity, but just sort of what are the key themes there? And for each of those things, before you even get to outcomes, think about the outputs. What are you delivering? And Because um, that's the stuff you need to count and monitor. And when evaluation comes, they can use the data that you'll be ready if you've got all those things. You're documenting those key things. Part of the, the thing, it's sort of um, what, what I find is that one of the challenges in that space is figuring out not only to identifying those key themes and activities and what the outputs are, but also the, the theory of action. What, what the, how does it supposed to all work together? Because the impact is later on, but is there some sort of theory around, um, is there a sequence? of these activities need to be delivered to the, or do they happen all the same day. Um, that's also important to, to think about. Um, and then, yeah, I think impact measurement, one of the other things that I think is really hard to decipher in that space is creativity, um, <laughs> um, what is it, inherent value and um, instrumental value of the arts. It's really hard to, it's quite challenging. <laughs> challenging to measure. Um, but. To keep it, again, what, what I will say, because those conversations are, are, are happening still in the evaluation sector, we're not, I, I wouldn't, don't try to solve it. Just focusing on your inputs, activities, outputs are really critical because if you get that right, I think a lot of the times we sort of go to, to these, doing your project plans and then you're delivering, but if you don't sort of think about w and collaborating with the other people that are in, it's a project, so it's, it involves everyone else, figuring out how, um, agreeing on what those activities are, what the themes are, and then aligning them with your impact. And of course, making sure that the community's voices are, are, are reflected in those impacts because you, the project person, or you, the evaluator, are not the only person in this journey. The, um, the people that actually know the impact of the people that are gonna come and attend your art or engage in your art project. Um, what are they gonna um, feel? What are they gonna hear? What are they gonna see? And, and taste, I don't know. All of those things were important um, changes to capture. Um, but it's really hard to reflect. Sometimes we forget their voices. Um, yeah. Thank you. Um, Jen and Tristan, given you in the world of program design, delivery, you know, and kind of working with communities in these long term, big scale ideas. It'd be great to hear from you your thoughts and perspectives on firstly co design or sort of how you how you design this practice together um, and also how you even think about measuring something like impact and if it's useful even. Um, I, I think I could sort of just riff off what Tim, um, Tim said. Um, I did a diagram because I, I like to work with whiteboards but we don't have one up here. Um, and I know you won't be able to see it at the back so I'll try and describe it as the best I can. Can you hold the microphone? Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, is this the x-axis? Okay, and that's the y-axis, yeah? Okay, um, what often happens in any sort of project, community engagement project councils, you know, um, and co-design processes is that you get all the people into the room and then there's this huge download on people, there's some catering, and then we go, um, we're gonna do a brainstorming session for the next 30 minutes. Surprise, yeah. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> um, and, Everyone's just, their, their, their energy's depleted. They might not have been engaged in the process. But what we know is that um, when we center relationships and time together, um, in the first bit of time that we spend together, we are just, we're, we're basically knocking shoulders. We're asking the things that have already been said before. You know, we're tossing out things that are boring, um, things that somebody else did. Um, all of that, that sort of thing. As we spend more time together, we start to generate more ideas. We keep on going. We start to understand people's bias, biases, you know, their backgrounds, their experiences. 
And then somewhere up here, this is where you're starting to get like some crazy, crazy ideas. Then you have drop off and that's exhaustion. So somewhere between boring and that's been done before and crazy is where we get some good ideas. We get to know people. I, we, that's where we start to spend time. And then we start to see what the priorities are. You know, it's often the invisible things. Um, they, they can be invisible problems or issues or something that's interesting that a whole bunch of people are engaged in. So. Um, it's interesting thinking around that in terms of co-design as well with the experience of working uh, recently on this body of work celebrating LGBTIQ plus elders um, and I remember moments where I would come and hope and say we will make this thing together um, and a lot of people were like no you will go and get the catering for me and I will sit down and you will perform for me and I will have a great time uh, because my priorities are different from you and I think I'm really responding to the way that you're thinking around this sort of uh, sector and industry um, application for the creative arts and once I started to work that out to understand how um, a querying of my own artistic practice in terms of taking or collaborating or being or representing at different times and moments in a process the mercurial nature of the relationships as we're saying everyone changes people are all different it's incremental it's moment by moment there's no rhyme or reason to it there's values but values are understood by different people in different ways so that idea of being able to be in constant um, dialogue in constant work the thing had never finished it still hasn't finished it will never finish um, we then used our impact our evaluation as another extension of the creative practice of bringing people around and sharing that evaluation and saying look you've written this yeah that was true that music was pretty shit wasn't it um, that worked really well all of this stuff was included and it's interesting when projects that we've worked with where we've sort of been um, the midwife and then it's taken on by different people, that there are sometimes some cultural institutions or some creatives that are not prepared to share those things, those failings, those successes, and that doesn't make any sense. The evaluation document that they've spent hundreds, thousands of dollars on to articulate the value of what they've just done with community is not shared with community. It happens so often. It's that thing of not finishing it to the end, but also not sitting with what is actually revealed in your evaluation to then lead to what the next thing is. And so the process of going, yes, actually, the curation of that, because someone has to be an artistic lead in something, didn't work. Well, actually, the reason was, bit, 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 bit stressed out trying to fund that or didn't really think about that because at that time there was a camera crew there so apologies because that person didn't want to have their face on camera and effed up. But the conversation around that of bringing community who are participants and allies and audience and the reason why you're doing it has to continue past the event, the art. Um, and so that learning and the way you've described evaluation, I think should be an artistic practice, um, continued on with artists, with community, so that actually, and as you say, the, the document that we've made is you know, a proud thing that's shared around and discussed, because it's also around a cultural memory of a point of time that, yeah, we worked together on. Thank you. As he's talking, I'm thinking also about, you know, how, what the expectations are when working in community context to have everything solved and answered before you even start. So, you know, if you apply to a grant and it's a community arts and cultural development practice, say, you know, you're asked from the get-go, who are you working with? What's the plan? What are the outputs? What's going to happen? But if you applied to a, a grant in the experimental practices area, you're literally being funded for your idea. And I think, you know, there is nothing more experimental than working with communities, actually, if you're honest and it's genuine. Um, because if you're walking into that experience with a preconceived idea of what that's going to be, then is that actually community-engaged practice at its core? Um, 
and why isn't there a greater level of trust and who gets to decide or police um, the sort of processes that are at play. And I guess to me it makes me think about how communities and people who are participating in any kind of project are sort of patronised from the get-go about needing to be managed um, <laughs> through a process when actually, back to your earlier point around we build our own worlds, we're capable of that. Imagine what would happen if we let ourselves live our wildest dreams. Well, yeah, 100%. And it's like, you know, it's, it's, you know in, in that space we've got to be curious rather than be the gatekeeper and, um, you know, think that we know it all. I mean, that's the, worst, the most boring thing about architects is they just think they, they know absolutely everything. And they just seriously don't. But, um, but, you know, just be curious in those spaces, you know? Like, it's, um, that's where, the, that's, that, that's where the, the bit goes up, you know, to the little black dot in there, you know? It's somewhere um, everyone's... Um, and, um, yeah, that's enough. <laughs> you can you can do that. Um, speaking of curiosity, and um, I mean, I have more questions than answers. Always, I hope I always do. Um, I hope that's my life forever. Um, we're going to ask you if you have any. Um, is there anyone out there who'd like to ask this group? I mean, I've got plenty. I can keep asking, um, but just wondering if there's anyone who'd like to ask a question. Yeah, please. Um, Mike, incoming. Thank you. Oh, me on mic. Um, I was listening to a, a, a good podcast some people would know, like from what is to what if or whatever, what is to what next. And it was awesome. And they were talking about how we live in a left brain world that's always trying to control the right brain. And so like creative people always need to go via really kind of robust, rigorous processes. And I like to call it sort of evil quant that sometimes doesn't actually, it lies as much, you know. And I just wanted to know, how do you navigate a world of relational work and relational projects and doing the relational part in a world where it's dominated by, like, you know, not, not always evil quant, but just this oppressive nature of needing to, you know, perform or create an output or do that. How do you, how do you work to create that space with people? Um, I, I think it's, it comes down to being really honest about this idea that, like, we, we don't really know what we're doing until we're doing it. <laughs> <laughs> no, but, I mean, that's what I do. I, I'm just kind of, every time I start a new project or whatever, I'm like literally just going like, I, I don't really know, I, I won't know what I'm doing until I'm doing it. And, and it's really important to recognise your own vulnerability. Like we're under so much pressure to know what, what it is that we're doing and, and those things with outputs. And it's just, well, like, I don't know, it's okay to, to literally like run it up the flagpole and see if it flies, you know, and just continue to do that. And that's how we kind of, like we build relationships of trust with people, but it's also how we figure out what, what people's needs are as well, you know, so yeah. Um, I also think when you're working with community, if you frame it like, for example, I mean, it's the wrong term, but in a cultural context, like the role of an artistic director, their role is to support the artists of their festival. And their job is to have a multiplicity of being able to talk about whatever stage that artist's work is at, to advocate for the artist, even if it's going to be not, you know, even if it'll be cancelled on opening night, it'll still be the best show and you'll want to invest in this, you know, and so there's different ways to talk about the stages and relationships that you're engaged in. And I guess thinking about community practice in that um, interdisciplinary, intersectorial way is also a really great way to, to, as well as be honest, but also for those people that may not understand actually what relational practice is, having a great time at pitching what the project can also be. So like, Fun Run is a, celebra uh, a public celebration, a work of mine. It's a public event. It could be a corporate event. It could be an endurance performance piece. 
It could be a community celebration, thinking around the multiplicity of how you talk about the way to support communities in different ways outside of the arts, I think is also a nice way, but also I agree with you, maybe also being honest. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I was just trying to think about um, all, of, I guess that, this is my evaluator hat on and I've been doing, I've been doing evaluation for about 11 years just as an external evaluator. So coming into a space like Footscray Community Arts Center, I think I, I did, we did, uh, I did an evaluation with a student um, of the WOW Festival, um, the Women of the World Festival. And that was really cool. Um, I was uh, mentoring the student, but I guess Thinking about um, heavy quant and um, and relational things, how do you balance that out? One of the things that I'm always really curious about in when I'm as an evaluator looking at projects um, and looking at that, and I, what I always am curious about is how engagement, the engagement work, that sort of work that you do to build trust, is never part of um, the things we measure. It's sort of sitting in the communication strategy documents or something, but um, in our measurement tools, we don't document stuff like that. And, and in evaluation, what we do, well, I remember was the student and I were looking at, um, we have a tool called the program, log uh, program logic. And that what a program logic does is it sort of unpacks what the project looks like, because it's, it's really abstract. What does your project look like if you were to visually try to think about it? It's really difficult, there's so many moving parts. But what a program logic does is just identifies those core components that are, you can measure that are, um, that are useful to measure that will, um, to, that will lead to your outcomes and your impact. The outcomes part of it and the impacts part of it is a, it's quite a complex thing, but it, I mean, at its basics, you could just, um, you identify all the outcomes, the changes that you expect people that are gonna attend, for example, the festival, what are they gonna feel, what are they gonna hear, you know, the see, hear, feel, touch, whatever, that kind of, what changes they're gonna, um, um, are you gonna be able to, to, to measure there? But, what we also added in that theory of, ch they call it theory of change. What are the sequence of outcomes that are gonna happen before you get to your impact? It's important, to, I think that's an important thing. Um, and we added relational engagement in there as a core proxy before any of that happens. Um, and, and then involving and con making sure that all the stakeholders are involved in that conversation because they need to see that in order to get to the impact you want, we can't get it without um, engagement and communications and all of these things being happening. So actually put, putting it as part of your measurement framework is really important and sort of, that's how I, as an evaluator, would navigate through those relational things because I, I, I can't do my work without relationships and connection with people on the ground. And, and um, but, but funders never, they don't have time for that, they just care about the end, end goal. And so having to, lay it out in that program logic tool is really a useful tool to think about navigating through all the quant stuff that they want, but, all, but um, also op it allows you to communicate that in order to get what you want at, um, at the end, these things, um, these engagements and these um, relational factors actually take time, six months sometimes, six, at minimum, that's my rule anyway. When I talked to a state, I was like, six months minimum, we need to engage with community before we can get any delivery, they need to agree with everything, and that trust to be built. So there's almost like, engagement is an important thing. What is engagement, what do you measure? How do you measure it? And how can you document it? Um, um, because, and then being critical about how does that fit into your outcomes? Where does that slot in? Because put it in there and, and, and argue for, yeah, to, just to lay off you a little bit, because they'll always be pressuring you, and you say, well, no, these, this trust is important, it takes time. Mm. Just um, on your question too, I just actually wanted to say thank you and um, also to, well, I was going to say pay respects, but just really more in some ways celebrate everyone in this room who really goes up against it every day in the ways that you're talking about because those microaggressions, those kind of systems, those um, colonial systems, those oppressive systems that we work within that we constantly have to sort of like butt up against day in and day out to try and make space for exactly what you're talking about, the relational, the relationship, the heart of, the ethics of, the integrity of, doesn't come unwon, you know, and I think um, 
how to cope. I, my own thought as you were asking that question was like, I need to take breaks from those systems in some ways, but never breaks from the relationships that you build along the way. Um, because I think, um, well, for me at least, I can step in and step out to keep being um, impactful. But um, whether it's in government or an organisation or, you know, in a political system, whatever it is, because everyone in this room who works with communities or as an artist or a practitioner is doing that every single day as a truth teller, as a storyteller, as a practitioner. Any... Yes. Hi. Um, I was just interested if anyone wanted to give any examples of working with communities of either an epiphany where you felt like you were at cross purposes and then suddenly you understood something or something that you kind of messed up where you were able to retrieve the relationship. Um probably give an example. Um, so I've been, through my other work, um, rehearsing climate-related disasters um, at Arts House for a number of years. And um, during COVID, um, the pandemic, the largest outbreak in Australia was 20 metres from my back fence in Faulkner. And I had just done some um, food systems research for Mary Beck Council at this moment and had lost all my work as an artist. And I had this moment where I said to my partner, like, if there was a moment to step up, like, this is kind of it. Um, and we ended up, basic, long story short, um, the pandemic, um, all of the food relief organizations closed in the north. And it was the most heavily impacted community. Um, 7% of Melburnians were out of a job and were heavily impacted. It was 50% in Faulkner. Um, there was no relief. Nothing ever came. And so what I said is, I can do producing. I can do this. I can, do, I can contribute 15 hours a week. Um, can I have the bowling club? You know, and I just sort of pulled as many people working in the food system into this space. I'd never ran a food hub before, but basically operated with three things that I learned from the Refuge Project is, what do you have, what do you need, what can you offer? And when anybody came into that space, it was just a matter of like ha everyone having a role, understanding their own skills and capacities and knowledges and their networks. And then basically my job was sort of mobilizing all of these things and also telling everybody, we've never done this before. Right? But the, the intention is, is that we're bringing community together because basically the reinforcements aren't coming. And for 21 months, we ran a food hub. Um, it's continuing to be ran by one of our volunteers. We turned a community market garden. And I say we, not me. Like uh, We had 60-something volunteers um, turning um, a community garden into an urban farm. Um, lots of things have changed since then, but like, I mean, I find that those three questions were inviting so that for anyone who came in the door, they actually could step in and see themselves. And we had people who were isolated who came and volunteered. We had people who um, wanted to give back because they were receiving. And by the way, we, we changed the whole food relief. We went to food justice lens. Um, and we created sort of a momentum, you know, like in terms of, um, people having a sense of place, a sense of community, that sort of stuff. And those three questions just help do that. Um, a really good epic fail that I remember uh, is, um, <laughs> um, is a lot, uh, but I feel like evaluators should be comfortable with failure because, um, project failure anyway, and having systems in place to sort of adjust and adapt. That's something that I've um, been comfortable with that. But, um, it's hard with community, though, particularly when, as an in, I, uh, First Nations from Kiribati, and um, if that community is the beneficiary of the project that's running, and you are accountable not only to the evaluation, because um, you're the evaluator, but you're also part of that community, um, and and that's the hard bit. And I think that you sort of had to, uh, yeah, being one of the things that there was a lot of failures along the way, and I think. Uh, we had a really great mentor and a, and a great boss at the time, um, um, Professor Janet Clinton, who was very, um, who, con who taught me that um, evaluation isn't just about accountability. It, it, a core part of it is just learning, and learning along the way. The data that we collect, 
the, the insights need to be fed back really quickly back to the program. And so having feedback mechanisms was a really core cool part of correcting those epic failures and just feeding it back as quickly as possible. And, and particularly now, I think, um, if, if you're thinking about your own projects, oh my gosh, th automate them with a technology and AI. If you can do that automation, it'd be so quick because feedback back in, when I was doing evaluation, it, it took a long time. I had to travel out and present it out and it, 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 was, it was difficult. But now with automation, if you can do it, do all those things because those feedback mechanisms are critical to co making corrective actions to those small little failures before you get to the big epic one. Apart from my outfit in 2018 of what I wore to the coming back out, well, I think one of the learnings it was pretty good. It was pretty good. Um, one of the learnings actually was through hoping to offer a generous, um, bountiful outcome uh, for a community over a period of time, learning about the intercultural complexities of my own communities um, and the negotiation of that in space. So we're talking about cultural spaces. Um, uh, and I guess the assumption of that being something outside of that, but also negotiating safe cultural space within communities as well, which is um, an incredibly minute and difficult thing. It moves and it changes and uh, you are profoundly, it, it can also um, uh, challenge your own values within that the assumption that we share these things and the experience of, oh, you're, you don't think that or you experience that. It manifested by not necessarily in one event having a representation of every intersection of the communities in the show, <laughs> the outcome. And five years of um, building trust gone for a particular community in a minute. Um, and for months I would receive, the trolling was amazing, it was incredible. Um, but I think also the learning from that was also that there was agency and that it was a connection and a buy-in to actually what was happening. So the learning as a practitioner or as, a, as a, an artist was actually um, the pathways for that allowed for people to say and express and feedback like, you know, almost as quick as that AI that you're talking about. Yeah, I think um, just knowing, I think, that along the way, like, that you can, like, you can put out, a, I guess, a certain position in the public sphere. And that, it's like, sometimes you just feel really, um, like, teethered to it. And people are holding you to that. And it's just like, well, I put out that particular stance on on this you know like you know say four or five years ago or something like that and and knowing that like that is something that's capable of change and it's just trying to figure out how to sort of do that and and give yourself a, a little bit of forgiveness that you, you're sort of you know on a path of of learning as well and you know, for instance, it's, I, I mean, uh, you know, when I've had cr critiqued stuff on particularly gendered spaces and stuff and, like, written some articles and, you know, those things that I've written, say, six or seven years ago, they might not be how I feel right now or something like that. And if someone wants to hold you to those particular views or whatever, like, you just have to sort of let them and, you know, but everyone just needs to understand that we're all on a process of learning and a, um, that, that ideas change after an amount of time and those opportunities will come for you to, to articulate a new idea. Yeah, thank you. Um, other questions? What a great panel of people to talk to. Thank you for being here. Um, so, if the relationship is the project, can we talk about the nature of the relationship in a way? Um, maybe as an artist, I hold collaboration as the zenith. As you know, we are collaborating. And that's a true meeting and we're kind of coming together to create something we couldn't do alone. But 
Um, that's hard one, isn't it? So what are the stages to get there? So maybe cooperation is on that scale, and I wonder if there's any other kind of modes and roles that you all think about and, then, and that you use in order to perhaps get somewhere else, knowing that you can't get there from the very first? Yeah, I think there's so many different ways to think about that as well. So we think about sometimes work that is instigated by an issue, um, work that is instigated by people, relationships, collaborations. Sometimes it's us as artists that want to make something with people as well. So there's a multiplicity in terms of the way that we would engage or connect at the genesis of a project. And I guess talking about that project from that particular perspective is something that we try to learn how to do in different ways to be able to start that conversation, what that looks like. But there have been many times when I have said, hi, you don't know me. I about to run a marathon on a treadmill and I'd like you to dance for me for five hours. It takes a while to sort of like negotiate what that would look like or, you know, be in dialogue around it. So I think the important thing is, and I try to do it, even though we are on the beginning of a journey, a creative journey, is to actually try and give some visualizations for the end point. Like, I don't want to take you on a journey where the outcome is actually going to be a crap artistic experience for you. I want it to be magnificent. I want it to be joyous. I want, you to t I want it to take over your world and I want it to be aligned with some of the things that I said to you way back when, when we had that first conversation. So part of it for me is around visioning and actually pitching a process that will lead to an outcome that makes sense for people that sit outside of an artistic context. Because if it doesn't, then there is a strange relationship between process and outcome. I want those processes to be aligned with fantastic outcomes that then we can read about in our evaluations for years to come. Um, and so that negotiation, I think, is really important at the beginning of a process. Have you guys um, heard about, I think, cultural count dashboard? Uh, if you haven't seen it yet, I'm, I'm blown away. I only just saw it just tonight uh, before I got here. <laughs> I was just like, what's going on in the art space? And so cultural count, the cultural count dashboard is really, it's, it's amazing. It just, it collates a lot of the, um, the on the ground data and sort of brings it up to a broader level of, of sort of collaboration and what sectors are there. And if I think about like 10 years, oh, I don't know, seven years ago when I started at Footscray Community Arts Center, I couldn't, even knowing who you can collaborate with or what sectors are like overlapping your area as an artist or a community, um, a cultural leader. So I, I'm also on the, uh, the Victorian Kitabas Association's board and we think about who can we collaborate with and we don't know where to go. And you know, it's like, who would be interested? Um, but that, those kind of information, the dashboard is so, it's key, it's, it's, it's one of them. It's, it's just great to see, okay, so I know now where those sectors are identifying, what sectors can align, can, will fit with some of the values of my work, the cultural work that we were doing was, was, specific, was Pacific Island culture, and so we connected with other Pacific Islands in Melbourne and um, other interested climate change um, organizations that were interested in the islands and it was, it was but it's sort of knowing what those sectors are is, is the first part and figuring out how you fit there. Um, personally, as a, as a practitioner, although it's sort of um, that trust and relational things, such an important f part of the work that I do sort of the relationship to my values and my cultural values particularly. I don't think I, I'll be able to be able to connect to anything or to do my practice without, or at least know the difference if I didn't know where what my baseline is, or almost, right? So knowing where you, you what you bring in the space, it's like, okay, so that's how they do it. And in actual fact, what happens is you get to learn a lot more. I, I've learned so much more about myself by learning with different diverse people. It's absolutely amazing. Is how much I thought I've, I've grown, but no, there's so continual growth in, in connecting relationship with your own values and your, um, yeah, your, whatever it is that there's in, in there, that's um, being, yeah, that's sort of uh, 
it's shown up when you're connecting with people that are different, that have different perspective, diverse perspectives than you. Hi, Dan. Thanks for the question. Um, I, I think there's an element of time here, like um, that I don't think we've necessarily discussed very much. Um, Claire Coleman, who she's put this part in the, in our chapter, where she talks about W. E. H. Stanner, who's an anthropologist, who coined um, Aboriginal Australians' concepts of time, the everyone, which embeds all time and space and relationships. And I think when it comes to thinking about collaboration, um, there's like the academic way of saying, you know, transdisciplinary, you know, where we're making new knowledge together. Or there's sort of this idea of the, or, you know, this, this cultural understanding, this deep cultural understanding of the everyone, where um, y you don't know where your beginning is, right? You might actually know people, you know, you have all of these sorts of links and so forth to other people and I think it's just placing yourself in that moment and then you don't know if you're going to collaborate until like maybe 10 years from now or somebody you know really well is going to collaborate with that person. It's, it's, um, it's like you have your bonding groups. It, Daniel Aldridge talks about this, like you're, um, he's a disaster sociologist. He talks about like your bonding groups, the people you have your really close relationships with. You've got your um, bridging, those that you sort of can link into others. And then you have, um, sorry, it's bonding, bonding, bridging, and linking. So yeah, bonding, bridging, and then linking are the ones that can actually open, expand things up, you know, and, and so forth. But I think in terms of your question, it's, it's sort of assessing where your beginning is and not necessarily knowing where your destination is. And possibly your destination determines the purpose for the next. And I just wanted, I keep, this keeps coming up, um, Jade, in terms of your book and about documentation, like um, indigenous cultures are oral, right? And so knowledge is constantly generated and shared and so forth. And when you put it in a book or in a document, it becomes fixed. One of the things that I was so excited about with the relationship with the project is that you gave the opportunity to others who have written to, to, to move it and evolve it and so forth. And I think that that, in terms of documentation of anything, to give your community the opportunity to, to reflect and to change and to evolve and, and so forth, I think it's, it's, it's a great thing to, to offer um, people in terms of processes. Thank you. I mean, it was one of those things that I just thought you can't possibly have written a chapter pre-2020 um, and then have a next edition come out in 2024 and not maybe want to change something about it. <laughs> sort of like, be, or maybe not, but like at least have the opportunity to do that because it's, um, I mean, that's a whole other panel. 10 panels, 10,000 panels. Um, do you have anything you'd like to add to that before we start to wrap, Simona? Okay. Um, I'm just gonna ask the panel for one more um, kind of gift, please, um, for us tonight. But when we were talking about this idea of world building, Simona, you said, you know, I actually think we're in a time of repair um, and not just the air conditioner, um, but from a social justice perspective. And I guess I'd like to ask the panel, you know, if this is our time of repair and reset our generation's moment to do that, then what are, what are we stepping out with? What are the things that are the most important for us all to take away from this room tonight and think, okay, that's, that's for me to do? Okay, well, I started it. Um, yeah, well, I, like I think, yeah, we are. I mean, at, at the University of Melbourne, like in the architecture faculty, there's a lot of chat about repair, and that's all this chat about repair within the context of sustainability. And um, yeah, you know, like, you know, they're still talking about life cycle of buildings that's like, you know, 20 years, and I'm just like, whoa, like, fair income. But actually, I'm like, repair, wait, wait a minute, like, we, we have to really think about social repair, you know, we, to, in order to achieve, um, you know, these very radical worlds, you know, we, we need really radical, um, you know, ways of, of finding repair. And it's really about changing the systems within which we're sort of working under. Um, you know, it's not about, you know, comfort and 
all that sort of stuff. I, I don't think we're going to... I think we're going to find out a whole new level of comfort this summer, you know. So, yeah, I think that's, that's the context within which I'm trying to angle that discussion of repair that actually, it's actually like a social justice lens that we need to put onto things. I agree with that. <laughs> um, in, in those moments, because, it, yeah, summer is coming... Um, maybe also just those moments of joy of being able to breathe and have, uh, you know, a moment to moment of being able to get through some of the enormities that we're dealing with. Um, and I think you're, it's really interesting when you're saying around the structures that are um, needing to be shifted. And I guess just the journey that that will take um, means that um, more worlds need to be made that we can continue to hide and collect in together to, to shift. Um, I'm, I'm sort of dealing with the sort of enormity and the, the, the micro and the macro at the same time, so, yeah. Okay, spoiler alert, um, because I've got my chapter. <laughs> um, um, because we, we kind of opened, we were thinking about this. Um, so we, we live in a period of unness, Ours is a time of the unprecedented, unexpected, uncertain, unstable, unpredictable, unknowable, and the unimaginable. How we reworld is we, res we resist, we focus on reparations and cultivate relations and resilience. We work in, in good faith around reciprocity. We put energy into resurgence and rematriation. We dedicate time to reconciliation. We make space for representation. And this is how we reworld. Um, I guess just thinking about uh, the, the, the chapter that I wrote in Cultural Safe Evaluation, that one of the things that comes to mind and sort of spinning off from what beautiful um, words that you shared. Um, so thinking about your I, I, when I think about repair, I think about connection, and that's the space I've been working in during COVID in um, Aboriginal community-controlled organizations um, with VACA, but also with the other 15. I had us a comment doing training with them and trying to build their monitoring system. Um, and gosh, I learned really quickly that um, they, some ACOs are not even ready to do that yet. And so how, but then where do we go? And so it was sort of going back to the drawing board and figuring out, well, what's the value here for them? What's the value add? And we had to um, really go back to history and go back to culture. Uncle Donald, who was my mentor, was there co-facilitating with me. And we really thought about connecting evaluation to culture and, um, and going through almost a remembering process um, remembering for uh, Indigenous people, Aboriginal people in, um, that we were working with, the teams there, to remember that evaluation isn't that scary. Um, it's what we do as humans, and particularly with Aboriginal communities and mobs, they've been doing it for thousands of years. This is why they've survived, and um, it's about learning, uh, adapting, and that's something that they're really good at. Um, and so don't be scared of it, it's fine. <laughs> um, um, so that's what we had to do, and it took that a, lo a long time, it took three to f minimum three months um, to sort of convince them to actually even to, to say yes, that, that's what it took. And so connection to that is really important, to that story is really important when you work in community. Figure out what the value of evaluation is, because most of them won't want to have anything to do with it, and so it's quite an important thing to to do that and having, yeah, connection to, yeah, to your culture, connection to your own values, connect, in order to connect out. Um, and I guess I really practically would invite everyone in this room to read the Uluru Statement from the Heart this week and remind ourselves what we're being invited to do as individuals of this place and um, for many of us as visitors and settlers on this place. Um, I'd like to thank you all for joining us this evening and please join me in thanking Jen, Tim, Tristan and Simona for your generosity. <laughs> Thank you.
Um, thanks to New South Publishing, the second edition is due to land all going well without deadlines on the 1st of March 2024. Um, so I think um, we'll be able to get in touch with you to let you know about that when the time comes. And just again, thanks for spending your evening with us. It's really nice to see all of your faces. Take care, travel well. Thank you.